Skateboarding is a ridiculously difficult sport. Skateboards are thin, wobbly pieces of wood precariously balanced on metal trucks that slide around on concrete, wood, metal, and who knows what else. The sport is taking place in every axis under the sun, with the person, the board, and the surface all changing angles relative to each other all the time. Not to mention the fact that the skateboard isn't even attached to you. It can just roll away at any moment. And the whole sport takes place in these tiny increments of time. Like your average grind lasts half a second with massive consequences for even the slightest error in placement of the board. Given all this, unsurprisingly, most people suck at it. A few lucky souls get half decent, but what about those Nijers or Mullins of the world, those freaks? What makes them so unbelievably good? Why are they so shockingly precise, consistent, and balanced? What are they doing differently to the average skater, the average Joe? To answer these questions, we need to step back a little bit to how we learn to skate in the first place. It's not just a difficult sport to do, it's a difficult sport to learn. The first few months, even years, for the average skater is spent limply rolling back and forth, doing very little other than just rolling. Improving requires countless hours of grind with very little instruction beyond just trying to do the next trick. It's considered intuitive and experimental, but fundamentally, why is this? What are you actually learning movement-wise beyond the specific tricks and skills themselves? When people say the kickflip unlocks all the other tricks, what do they mean by this and what's happening? When we look at the best skaters in the world and compare them just to regular skaters, the differences aren't actually that obvious to see. Like, yes, they land harder tricks, but beyond that, there's nothing fundamental that really pops out visually that you can see different. It just seems that some people can do harder tricks than others. And you might be mistaken for thinking that this is just a product of their psychological ability to just send something. And if the landing rate for tricks was consistent for all athletes, then this would be yes. But as we all know, this is not the case. The best athletes are horrifyingly consistent. Like, yes, they still make mistakes, but if they were bailing everything the rate that I would bail it trying it, they'd all be dead. Here's what I propose. Moving well is hard. Skating at a high level requires high level movement skills. These pro athletes largely have a lot of these skills and regular people don't. They often got lucky and learned to do it the right way and mediocre skaters learn mediocre ways to do it and bad skaters learn bad ways to do it. There are lots of different ways of achieving movement outcomes and movement. It's just that some work way better than others. In this video, I'll break down some of the skills that those elite skaters have and how to learn some of them. I'm gonna break this down into two broad categories, external movements, things you can obviously see like an arm or a knee bending, and internal movements, things you can't obviously see like shifts and tension in the body. Skateboarding excellence is a lot more about that second category and that will make way more sense as we get into the meat of this video. So to begin, I'm gonna look at one of the most crucial skills in skateboarding, balance. What is it at its core? How do we maintain it? How do we lose it? How do we even learn this? Can you improve it? So to answer this question, I wanna use a metaphor. What, and bear with me on this, what is easier to balance on your hand? A rock or a bunch of loosely connected springs vaguely glued together? Now, obviously it's the rock, but there is more to this than meets the eye. Think about the human body. We have the capacity to be both like this rock or a bunch of loosely connected springs. For balance, the more you're like the rock, the better. This is a stable, predictable load. It doesn't change shape, it doesn't suddenly collapse, it doesn't do anything at all. It's easy to predict and thus control. In a human body, this load is basically your torso, arms, and head. They're just the thing that you carry around with your legs. And they all weigh stuff, they're heavy. And the wobblier and more unpredictable this stuff is, the harder it is to balance it. The best skaters are unbelievably stable. They do not wobble or flail at random when they're skating. When they're skating, they make their torso, arms, head into a predictable load. The most typical areas of instability for less good skaters are basically in these areas. The spine, in particular at the belly button level and upper spine area, can be very unstable in people, both left to right, in particular at the belly button level, and forward to back further up the spine, as well as the arms and shoulder blades, with often one shoulder in particular just acting like a crazy wobbly flail weight for a lot of people. Looking at someone like Nigel Skate, this is really obvious. Beyond moving at his ankles, knees, and hips, vaguely extending and flexing, he doesn't really seem to move that much at all. Like, yes, he moves an arm a bit or rotates a bit, but there's no dramatic, flaily, wobbly, out of control elements you see in a lot of less good skaters. Which, if you're paying attention, introduces a paradox of sorts. 
If being stable is just about being still, shouldn't it be really, really easy to, to balance? Just tense everything and bam, you're skating like a god. If you're unsure about this hypothesis, give it a go, but yeah, it's not gonna work. So there are two things you need to do here. I'm gonna start with the first simpler one that falls into the first category, which is external movements. The way that you stabilize matters. You can't do this indiscriminately. Not everything needs to be still all the time. In reality, you just need to stabilize your unique individual unstable parts. This is just a skill that pro skaters get lucky and learn to do very well naturally and the average person learns to do badly or just not at all. And there's an exceptionally easy way to work out where you may or may not be stable. Watch and feel yourself skate and just look at what looks obviously wrong about what you're doing. My background is more in parkour than skating but the principles here are absolutely identical. Just look at footage of you skating. Here's some footage of me doing parkour terribly in the past. If you look at this, you can see quite obviously that, for instance, my head is very forward, very unstable, very collapsy. My arms are basically acting like random flails. This is bad, unstable, unpredictable load management. Does your spine always collapse on landing? Does it always move to the left or to the right? Does it always move forward or back? What's it doing? Does the same shoulder always end up completely unstable during your movements? So once you've identified what those areas are, generally you wanna stabilize these areas with the big muscle groups that cross across multiple unstable joints. So getting your torso to be relatively and appropriately symmetrical is really important. One of the key muscle groups you're gonna to need to find are your lats, as well as your abdominals and obliques. In terms of your upper back and spine, your erector spina and thoracic extensors are gonna be super important. And for your hips, your glutes in particular are gonna be one of the big groups that are gonna to need to do a lot more work, probably one more than the other. Now the second less obvious part, even if externally you're pretty darn stable, you're still not gonna be elite. So again, there are two answers to this and I'm gonna start with the simpler external one. Much of the actual balancing of this hopefully now predictable load takes place at the ankle joint. You've gotta be really skilled at balancing and controlling your load with these muscle groups. Basically, you need to use your foot, ankle, and calf muscles to skillfully adjust this position with forward, back, and side-to-side -side movement. And this is realistically one of the biggest motor skills you're learning when you're learning to skate. I'm not gonna to spend too much time here, but some general things to look for are where the weight rests on your feet. If you consistently find yourself weight-bearing on a heel with weight traveling backwards through that leg a lot of the time, it's gonna be a pretty good indication that leg's not gonna be working well. Keeping the weight over the arches of the feet when you can is gonna allow these muscle groups to work a lot better. But anyway, I'm gonna spend a lot more time on the second part here, because I think this is a lot more interesting and something I haven't talked about in any videos before. The second and really crucial way that balance is maintained when you're skating is through internal tension shifts. And the best way to understand this is experientially. So I want you to pause the video and stand up. Actually do this though, because the video will make way more sense if you do. So I want you to stand with weight evenly on two feet and keep your external position completely fixed. So don't move an arm, a leg, a head, anything. Every part of your body just stays exactly where it is. Then I want you to push harder with one foot. So increase the amount of tension or pressure in the ball of one foot without externally moving anything. And if you find that hard to do, the key is quite simple. Just push your foot, like extend your calf, but don't actually move your ankle. Just push with your foot into the ground. This is, at its essence, a very, very simple example of just internal tension shifts changing the pressure on your feet. But there's actually a lot more you can add to this than you may initially realize. So I want you then to extend your knee joint. Do not actually straighten your leg, but to use your quad muscle as if you were going to do that, and that will again increase the amount of pressure in the foot. Then I want you to extend the hip joint. So as if you were gonna push off and jump powerfully using your glute, but again, not externally moving anything, and add the power of the glute into the pressure on the foot on that leg. Then I want you to use your inner thigh muscles, your adductors, to pull more pressure across. And what you'll notice is that with each joint and muscle group we add, we're increasing the amount of force and pressure we're putting into the ground on that foot. But we aren't moving as we're doing this. This is just a shift of internal tension. See how many other muscle groups and ways you can find to contribute more pressure onto that single foot. Can your abs contribute, your lats? What about your upper torso and head muscles? They might be quite difficult to get involved in a meaningful way. <laughs> then swap all of that tension and pressure to the opposite foot. Don't move your body in space, just shift the tension. Then do 40, 60, 90, 10. Swap between those two legs and then do it while grinding a rail and going 40 kilometers an hour. So yeah, this is a skill and quite a difficult skill at that. And it's not actually just applicable to foot pressure, but 
nearly any other body part in lots of different complex ways. But I'll save all that for another video. And what's really interesting about this skill is that there's no obvious visual indicator that you're doing this right or wrong, but it is crucial for adaptive high level balance. And one of the underrated reasons for this is that if you move an arm for balance, there's nothing inherently wrong with it. It's just that every time you move anything, it is in essence more instability that you need to balance. If you can achieve that same adjustment with internal tension, you're actually better off movement wise. So let's look at a slightly more applied example of this. If you're doing a rock fakie, when your board gets up to the coping, you want the wheel that's over the edge to essentially get lighter so it can roll back in easily. And the way you make the wheel lighter is by just taking weight and pressure off that foot. But there's a lot of different ways you could achieve this outcome. You could very obviously just lift your foot off the board with a big external movement, or throw the shoulder and arm that's on that side into the ear, making the foot lighter. However, neither of these are ideal outcomes. When you throw the arm and shoulder, you're in some ways throwing away part of your stability and you're making yourself more unstable and harder to balance. When you take the foot off the board, you're essentially losing your ability to be connected to that surface and to appropriately respond to any adjustments. And the foot itself that you lifted has then become another unpredictable load to balance. What you want to do realistically is just have the foot lighter on the board. And you can do this nearly entirely with an internal tension shift. And this is one of the many reasons why Niger and other pros don't obviously look that different. Much of what they're doing is happening inside their body. Now, I want to very briefly look at all this from an angle other than balance. Now, this is conceptually very closely related, but there are a few important distinctions to make. Only really effective way to steer when you're skating is by moving your center of gravity. Like, yes, you could just push with your feet, but that's the equivalent of just turning your bike handlebars, which is pretty much trash tear. And when doing this, we want to use as little conscious muscle activation and aggressive position adjustment as possible. And this is for a few different reasons, but I want to touch on one that's really important. The more extreme a position we go into when we're moving our center of gravity, the more support we're going to need to balance that position. So I want you to think about different ways you could move your center of gravity about when you're skating. You could, in essence, collapse everything forward, your head, your chest, your arms, and move your center of gravity in a direction. Boom, this is all mass, you'll get heavier in that direction and you'll go that way. In the same way, if you're biking, you could just throw your head over to one side and you'll start to go that way. But as you can probably intuit, this isn't ideal for a couple of different reasons. One, anytime you're moving external bits of your body, you're essentially creating more instability that needs to be balanced. And two, the more extreme the position that you end up in, the more force you need to support that position. So in the previous example, the muscles that support the upper head, let's say your thoracic extensor muscles here, can only hold against so much force in certain positions. And if the force demands exceed your capacity to support them, you'll essentially lose the position. So if you can no longer support your head, your head will essentially fall off. And since you're attached to it, that'll make all of you fall off. Or let's say on a more micro level, the forces exerted on some of the ligaments or tendons and muscles on the hip consistently exceed your ability to support those. In a specific movement, this could look like instability or movement failure, and over time, if that happens, that's going to be a cause for chronic injury. So again, emphasizing the second skill here, the more we can move our center of gravity with tension adjustments and the more minuscule the movements are, the better we're gonna be off and the easier those positions will be to support and the less unstable will be inherently. Which again is not to say that you shouldn't move things externally, but just that you shouldn't when you can achieve it in a different, better way. So before I move on to how to improve these skills, I quickly want to touch on two topics that I think are super relevant, important, and interesting. Falling over and the ideal body type for skateboarding. And this idea of falling over is something that is just a big pet peeve of mine that I wanna to touch on. A lot of skaters and even just generally good movers don't seem to understand this at all. Being able to bail without hurting yourself in the bail is an advanced movement skill. Like the inability to do this is one of the major reasons why a lot of people, in particular more mobile people, really struggle to learn this sport because they literally cannot imagine not hurting themselves when they fall over. And this isn't just them being weak or making it up, this is just a real practical, genuine reason. If we think for a moment about what's actually happening when we fall over, we'll very quickly realize that we're doing a lot of complicated things, whether or not we're conscious of them or not. You need to change where your base of support is, your reference point for stability, and you need to do that very quickly. And if you can't get that to your feet, you then need to disperse that force over as many different areas of the body as possible. What happens if you're not skilled at this is that that force will end up at a single point. And if the specific structure is a ligament or a joint or a bone, 
it's really easy to break this. The movement skill of dispersing force across lots of different areas of the body is just kind of hard. But it is a skill and you can learn it. It's just really hard to learn this in the context of falling over because falling over happens so quickly. It's such a fast thing that if you don't do this naturally right, it's really hard to learn this in this context. Maybe at some point I'll break down more of what these skills are and how you learn them. But for now, just stop hassling people about this. So the final thing before I go on to the how to's is it's worth mentioning that some builds are just way better for skating than others. Being super tall, heavy with broad shoulders and narrow hips is pretty much the worst possible build. If you've been paying attention throughout this video, why should be kind of obvious. I want you to think about balance loads. This big inverted triangle shape is just an inherently more unstable load to balance. The ideal build is being relatively short, relatively light with hips and shoulders around the same width. And what you'll notice is that on average, most of the best skaters tend to share this build. And this isn't to say that you shouldn't keep skating if your build doesn't match this, or that you can't be really good with a different build. It's just you're working with kind of a harder hand. Anyways, how to get better at some of these things. I'm gonna suggest a few different ideas here that you can try out for yourself. So if you're still struggling with this internal tension idea, there's another really simple way you can understand and practice this. If you just stand and have your arm out in space and get someone to put a weight in your hand, and if you don't move your arm as you do this in space, you've adjusted your internal tension. That's the only way you can do this, and this is actually a very useful way to practice this skill. So for instance, you could stand on a board on flat ground and put two weights in your hand and practice throwing them as if you're going into a particular movement. But while doing this, keep the tension the same on your feet. There's a lot of different ways you can apply this, and I'm not gonna make massive lifts here, but use your extra wrinkly brain that I know you have and see what you can come up with. I also really recommend using a wobble board. It's a fantastic way to practice many of the internal balance skills without having to do difficult skate stuff at the same time, like worry about rails. But don't just get like your basic wobble board, make it more difficult than that. Take the trucks off an old skateboard and put it on top of a basketball. Replace one side of the bottom of the wobble board with a much wobblier bit than the other side. Try and target these and focus on your unique areas of instability. You can also mix internal tension shifts into this, like getting people to put weights in your hands or moving your arms with weights in them or trying to keep the balance the same on both feet. There's an almost infinite number of variations of things you could do here that will improve the skills without having to do it in a high stress environment. Another really helpful thing you could do is improve your posture. You could conceptualize the process of improving your posture as learning to stabilize, understand, and predict the load, which is your torso. I have an ebook coming out soon about this, which goes into this in mega detail, or another YouTube video I made about it. I'll put the links for those down in the description if you're interested. But yeah, you can just think of your posture as how you support your position in space. And learning to do this better in day to day is gonna carry through into your skating and any other movement sport you're doing. Anyway, thanks a lot for watching the video. I hope you guys enjoyed it, found it interesting. Next up, I will make a video about something else. Peace out.